morning, everyone. Good morning. God is good. Uh, all, all the time. time. All the time. God, God is good. good. Amen. Well, welcome here to First Christians. As always, we're here because Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. He's here with us. We're going to worship Him. Amen. Amen. Everything that happens here, we're going to bring honor and praise to our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's really good to have everybody here. And if you're a visitor, please take a card, put it in the pew, fill it out first, put it in the plate. And if you have a prayer request, please do the same. It's really good to see everybody here today. And I'll tell you what, we had a men's prayer breakfast today. Uh, Randy wasn't able to cook, and it wasn't quite as good as it usually was, but McDonald's, you know, came through for us. But the most important thing is, uh, we had men here, and we were praying. We went around this building, and, and we prayed, and so the Lord is here with us, and I know that for sure. And so, thank you for being here. If you're watching online again or on Facebook, welcome. Hope to have you here in person very, very soon. Love to have you with us. A few announcements to make. Uh, there, there's a lot of them in the bulletin, a lot of things going on. But the main one is this Thursday night we're having the Abingdon High School football team and coaches here as we do every year. Churches take turns giving them a meal during the football season. And this week is our week. And uh, we usually do a spaghetti dinner and that's what we're doing again this week. And there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. If you're able to help in any way, especially with meat sauce or bread or salad dessert, please sign up and let us know uh, that you can do that. And if you can come early and stay set up tables and, and clean the church. And Katrina's not here today. They had to go out of town. And so please, if you don't do it for anything else, do it for me. Because <laughs> if, if you don't come through, I'm a, I'm a dead man. <laughs> 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 no, it's going to be all right. And we always have a lot of fun. And, uh, and we'll even let you eat some of the spaghetti that we have, too, so it's good, it's good for that. You know, I don't know if I've mentioned this, uh, but the Newberries, the young Newberries, stand up. Yeah, you, Josh. Okay. <laughs> I found out a couple weeks ago that they're going to be a mom and dad here. Hey. I'm glad about that. And so God bless you. I hope everything's fine there. And, uh, and Ron Snowden come walking in here. Ron, we haven't seen you in a couple weeks, and we're so glad that you're feeling better and they will be here. And lots of other folks. I don't want to leave anybody out. It's good to see everybody. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. That you love us the way you do. That you took our sins, every one of our sins, and took it to the cross. And paid our debt that we couldn't pay. And you rose from the dead, proven once and for all, <coughs> you are Lord of life and death and of the universe. And we love you, Lord. And we are here now. We are here because of you. So bless us. May the service be an honor to you and bring glory to Christ our King. We love you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Charlie. <coughs> well, good morning. All right. All right. Hey, let's all stand and sing. Send the light.
picking the two things that are very important to us, the salt. Everybody would agree with me that salt is an ingredient that you almost use in everything you eat. Very important. And light. Without light, we cannot see. So let's remember those two things. How the Lord is describing us that we should be light. And I'll like go ahead and read Matthew 26 about the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you provide us ways to remember the things you have taught us, things that we need to be. Most of all, Lord, to practice and to remember each other weekend the days that you have given us in this earth. Remember Jesus, what he has done for us as we partake in communion, uh, the bread and the juice. Help us to realize, Lord, <coughs> without that sacrifice, we would not have the freedom that we have today and to be able to know that one day we can be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
another part of our worship service is to be able to give back a portion that the Lord bless us with every day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that we allow to come to worship you in this place. <coughs> thank you, Father, that you care for the lost. And help us, Lord, as we give, give a cheerful heart, that you take this money, Lord, bless the money and help us to use it wisely. We thank you again, Lord, for this building and for the place that we come. Go with us as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
there anyone else at uh, this time we need to mention? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my brother David gave us on the entire list. Uh, they did soldier on him uh, last Tuesday, and he came home, it was Tuesday before last, and he didn't come home last Sunday, and then uh, about two days ago, she had taken him back to the hospital. He was in pretty bad shape, so keep him in your prayers. It's David. Lester. Is there anyone for Kurt? My niece, Rhonda Hale, she goes Wednesday for to start her treatments to do, and her husband was diagnosed with cancer three months before she was. Mm -hmm. Give him any prayers. What was her first name? Rhonda Hale. Uh, most of you all know that my nephew lost his baby. He was still born, and he's having a really, really hard time emotionally and spiritually, everything. And uh, I want to ask the church family to please remember him, Alex King, K-E-E-M-E, -E -E, and his wife, Chelsea. <coughs> oh, yeah, being a father myself, that's something I just folks that's uh, under the weather, sick, or whatever the situation may be. Lord, I know it's for Mr. Tom. I just, I can't thank you enough for how you use him to, to step on my toes and to help me see things differently. We love you, Lord. We pray that you'll forgive us, forgive us of our sins, Father. The sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Three praises I want to share just real quick before we get into the message. I don't know, a couple weeks ago, if you remember, we had a sort of a remnant of a tornado or hurricane come through here, and we about lost our bus garage. <laughs> I don't know if you noted, but I took a picture of it. It looked like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, it was way over and it needed some bracing. And so thanks to John Ratliff and his son and Walt and Jeff. You know, they came up here and they supported that thing with big posts cemented into the ground. So I think from now on, I think the thing's going to be pretty secure. So I want to thank you all very, very much for doing that. And also, our kitchen, you know, we've been remodeling for the last several months. 
And thanks to a lot of people, especially Ronnie Rose. Ronnie Rose has come up here so often, and he's headed up everything. And I think by tomorrow, the, the new kitchen should be totally functional for the dinner on Thursday with the football team. So I want to thank Ronnie and everybody else who's helped with that. The last one is this, and this is just a God thing. If you remember, Ron Prophet came up here about the uh, first part of July and challenged us to do a faith promise to get our building paid off. And at that time, you know, we started off in 19 or 2000 at, at $690,000 debt. And when we did the faith promise, we wanted to get it paid off by the end of the year. We had 38000 left to go. If you look out on the board now, as of right now, we owe $5,710. And so, you know, God had a better thing in mind. We don't, we're not going to have to wait to the end of the year like we thought to have the building paid for. It's going to be paid off very, very shortly. And I promise you this, and the board's talked about it, on, on November the 19th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we are going to have a Thanksgiving service that will top anything you have ever seen. And we are going to give glory to God, not only for building being paid off, but for all the things that he does for us every day. And, and for the magnificent Father that He is to us. So thank God. I want to thank you all for taking that faith promise on the way you did. You're very generous people. You always have been. And God has been good to us. And you have shown that. So thank you. Thank you and praise God for it. Amen. All right. So let's stand up. Oh, wait, Mark. I want to thank Tom for what he does for the church. Almost every project he's involved <coughs> He thanks about, you know, others, but we, we need to thank him, too, because he is. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll give God the glory. Give Amen. God the glory for everything. Thank you. Let's stand and greet each other warmly. Yeah.
Gladys, I want to know, you, you know what you've done to me? Every time I ring that bell now, I look up there and see if there's any toilet paper. <laughs> and that was you. They got the guard around me. <laughs> yeah, don't let him hear this thing. Larry, the beach needs to have felt you. Do you have a hear that? Today we're going to be talking about uh, a, a name of the message, Life on the Front Lines. And, you know, lots of things are, are happening in October, and I'll talk about a couple of them, one in particular. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you be with me and speak through me. To you, Lord, who needs glory and honor. So use me as your tool, as your vessel, as your servant. May your need, may meet needs of people be met through you today. May your spirit move right now in people's lives. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, I can't believe it, and you can't either, but this is October the 1st. I mean, come on, really? It seems like we just had Christmas a few weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's October 1st, and uh, I love October. I really do. I love the weather. I got a picture up here. I mean, who, who does not like the leaves turning in the mountains? It's so pretty. The air is so crisp and clean. You know, it's getting a little bit cooler and you need to sleep better at night. And, and, and the humidity is down. And it's just, just a wonderful time. I wish it lasted longer. But I just love October and what it brings. But October also brings something else that I'm not that crazy about. Halloween. Halloween. I mean, everywhere I go. I mean, a month ago, I walked into Lowe's you know, to get something, and I'm greeted by some ghoul or bitch or something, you know, some, some big blown-up thing, just some scary look, demon-looking zombie face thing. I go, oh, really? Come on. It's September. But that's the way it is, and it's coming. And, and horror films, you know, flood the screens, you know. And, and I, I mean, I'm telling you, there are times where some of these commercials for these horror shows come out, and I have to cover my eyes because I'm scared of the, the, the gruesomeness of some of these movies. And I can't believe that they're even allowed to be made, but they are, and evidently they're popular. You know, then there's a movie out now, and I've heard kids talking about it, about this clown that lures children and kills them and stuff. And I'm thinking, what's this all about? You know, this glorification of evil. I hate it. I hate evil being glorified. And you're going to think, oh, Tom, come on, lighten up, will you? You know, I know Halloween's got things with kids going candy. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about things where evil is glorified. And I believe the scripture has a lot to say about that. So I'm going to talk about that today. But I want to give an example, first of all, about what I'm talking about and how serious it is. You know, the, the spiritual realm, folks, is real. It's not a joke. You know, it's not a fairy tale. There's a spiritual realm out there that we are in battle with constantly as Christians and as believers in Christ. And we need to be serious about it. I've told this story before, especially on Wednesday nights, but back in 1975, I went and my mother and my aunt, we went to visit my cousin who lived in San Francisco. In fact, she lived in an apartment third story apartment just one block away from the famous Haight-Ashbury district where supposedly the hippie movement started. Lots of stuff that goes on in San Francisco if you've ever been there. But one night we were in her apartment and, and one of her friends came up to the apartment for dinner. And we had dinner and then all of a sudden this guy pulls out a pack of tarot cards. If you don't know what those are, there are certain cards with different pictures on them and things that you use to predict the future, you know, to do fortune-telling kind of things. And I'm going to tell you this, and you could believe me or not, but I'm telling you the truth as hard as I can go. When that man pulled out that pack of tarot cards and started eating, I wouldn't let him do me. 
But as he was telling people their fortunes and their futures, I felt a spiritual battle raging within me. It was like the Holy Spirit that indwelt me was at war with the evil spirits that were in the room. Now you might think, wow, you're, you're crazy. No, I'm not. I can't describe it to you. I can't tell you exactly what it felt like, but I knew that there was a spiritual battle going on in that very room because of those cards and the fortune telling that God has a lot to say about. So let's talk about that a little bit today. Because I don't want anybody to be deceived. I don't want anybody's children to be drawn into something that they don't need to be drawn into. The first scripture I want to read, and we'll continue with it later on, but in Ephesians 6, very plainly Paul teaches, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now listen carefully to this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says that's who our battle is against. The spiritual realm and the spiritual forces that are all around us. So we're going to look today at spiritual warfare. And I know many Christians blow this kind of stuff off. But I'm telling you, it's real. It's very, very real. So I want to give you a warning today and an encouragement. You know, we, we still have Christ in us if we're Christians, and, and we win, okay? But we need to be smart, too, and we need to be aware. The first point I want to make is don't go into a war without knowing your enemy. That would be stupid, wouldn't it? To just blindly go into a battle without knowing anything about your opponent. To do so is to invite disaster. You know, consider Gen General Armstrong, George Armstrong Custer. You remember him? Now, how many of you have ever been out there to the monument where Custer's last stand was? A few of us. I I've, I've been there. It's really an amazing thing. And I've got a picture of it there. And if you're ever there, you know, the little bighorn is not a very good picture, but it's a valley and there's the river there. And, that, and that's where the battle began. And as you look down to the river from the place where Custer made his last stand, you can see little grave markers scattered here and there. And as you get to the top of the hill, there's more markers and there's more markers. And finally, at the top where Custer met, met his end, there's graves everywhere because the, the soldiers were running, you know, away. And they were trying to, to get safe. And what is known about this is, you know, Custer went into battle with five companies of about 210 men, including pack horse drivers and mercenary Indian scouts. And he mounted a frontal attack on 2,000 infuriated Lakota Sioux and Northern Cheyenne warriors. Was it arrogance? Ignorance? Overconfidence? Improper planning? No plan at all? Whatever the reason was, it ended tragically for Custer and his men. You know, I, I think it's like going into a room, you know, with, with a, maybe a group of Hell's Angels. You know, big, tough motorcycle guys. And you walk, you know, they're in there, they're all, they got all their stuff and the chains and everything. And you walk in there with a stick and you lock the door and you go, okay, boys, we'll take care of it. Right Here we go. Uh, what, who would do that in their right mind? Who would do that? You know, even in sports, you know, every successful team scouts out the opponent. They, they try to find their strengths, their weaknesses, where, where they could go and, and have success. But in the Christian realm, and it seems like especially in this spiritual warfare, you know, most Christians just bebop along, not giving it a thought about Satan and his strategies against us. What a mistake. What a mistake for us to do that. I'm not telling us to be afraid of him or intimidated or anything else. But we do need to be aware of his strategies against us. What do we need to know? You know, back in 1990, I took a, a, a seminar from a man named Ben Alexander. 
Ben Alexander is a famous, you know, person who teaches about spiritual warfare. And the reason he knows so much about it is because he, he's from England. And when he was in England, he was a medium. In other words, he would conduct seances for people. And he was very much into the spirit realm. He had a room that had a, a, a big table in, in the middle where people would gather around. And, and written on that table was the Ouija board. You know, yes and no in the alphabet. And, and people would ask the questions and this little pointer would go around to give the answer. You, you could buy these things now from Mattel. You know, if you wanted to, and I'm going to talk about that. But, but Ben would tell us things about the spirit realm that is just horrifically, you know, real and, and frightening even in an extent. He said there would be times where they'd gather around that table, table and, and the little pointer would move by itself, answering questions that people would go because they had called on the spirit world, on demons, to come in and give them answers to questions. And Satan is very willing to do that to anybody that calls on him. We need to avoid things like that. We need to avoid things like horoscopes. You read your horoscope and say, oh, what's it going to be for me today? What should I do? Oh, my goodness. No, you don't need to read a horoscope. You don't need to call a 900 number on the psychic hotline and have somebody tell you what kind of day you're going to have or whether you should make a decision. You need to stay away from that kind of stuff. You don't need to look at tarot cards to find your future. You don't need to read tea leaves. You don't need to go to the palm reader. And you don't need to have a Ouija board by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. If you have any of those things, my advice to you would be to go home today and not put them in a the yard sale. I would take them and burn them. Amen. So nobody else could be subjected to these things that seem so innocent, even toy-like. But Satan can use them. Ben Alexander said the Ouija board is the most dangerous toy in America. Then we got the magic eight ball. <laughs> I got a picture of that thing. I mean, that is so crazy. But what I'm saying is, you know, we know it's a toy. You know, and it gives different answers, and people shake the thing and then look at the bottom of it. You know, but if you take it so far that you actually start asking it for advice, you're, you're in real trouble. This thing was invented in 1946 by a man named Albert Carter, the son of a clairvoyant. You can buy one of these things today on Amazon for $6.86, and it has a four and a half star out of five rating. Thousands of people buy this. And I want to read you something that one guy said, one of the comments of the Magic 8 Ball. And this is what I'm talking about when it gets dangerous. This is what a man said about the Magic 8 Ball. He says, quote, any issue that can be reduced to a yes or no question can be answered by the Magic 8 Ball. And it has allowed me to quickly make decisions about my career and personal life. And it has made the process of deciding who to vote for a breeze. <laughs> Another guy commented that he asked the eight ball if he should get married as he was in the foyer at the wedding. Should I go through with the wedding? And he shook the little eight ball and I guess he says, well, I guess go ahead. And so he did. Satan will use any trick in the book he can to get us to do anything except trust God. Yeah. Anything. If we could just take our minds off of trusting God and trust something else, even if it's something stupid like that, he'll go for it. And sometimes we fall for it. Now, I understand that these things are used as a gag a lot of times. But I'm talking about when people get so involved in reading the horoscope or fortune tellers or eight balls that they can't make any kind of decision during the day without consulting something like that. But what does the Lord, what does God Almighty think of making decisions based on things like this? Well, fortunately, he's very clear about it. Let me read you a couple of Old Testament teachings. In Leviticus 19, first of all, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. 
in Deuteronomy 18. When you enter the land the Lord has given you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive you out from those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. You know, why would God say that? Because the Lord wants us to trust Him. He wants us to trust Him for the future. He wants us to seek to Him for the answers of life. Not somebody else. But why do people want to know so desperately what will happen to them? Why do people go to fortune tellers? Why do people go to call psychics? Why do they want to know the future so desperately? I think it's because they're afraid. They're afraid. They want security. They want somebody to tell them that it's going to be okay. But to look to anything except God for that is, is idolatry. And it's sin. Another Old Testament teacher helps along the way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Very popular verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will make your path straight. Don't depend on anything else. Depend on the Lord. So we need to know the enemy. We need to be aware of his tricks and his traps that he set for us. And watch out for them and be aware of them. And then the second point is this. Go into battle prepared. Prepared. Who would go into a battle unprepared if they knew a battle was coming? And we have victory through Christ. You know, we're not going to do this stuff on our own strength. We're not going to have a victory because we're so great. We have the victory because Jesus won it on the cross. And he died for us and he rose again. And that's how we have victory. Now, continuing with Ephesians chapter 6. Paul continues and he says this. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Don't you see the picture Paul is painting here? We're painting a picture of a Christian going into battle. It's not a playground we're here, it's a battleground. And Paul knows that, and he's telling us to get ready to put on this armor, to be prepared to withstand the attacks of the evil one. We are in a war, folks, and we need to take it seriously. We have to be ready. I like what Jeff Strike wrote about this. There's an account from history, and some of you old-timers, like me, are going to remember these days. Some of you are not, maybe you read it in a history book, but I remember it very vividly. <coughs> Years ago, there was a brutal man. He was known as the Butcher. A follower of Stalin, this man was sent to the Ukraine shortly after World War II to put down a rebellion by Ukrainian nationalists. He was so efficient at what he did that he earned the nickname, the Butcher of the Ukraine. When Stalin died, there was a short power struggle, but eventually the butcher became the leader of the Communist Soviet Union from 1958 to 1964. Do you remember his name? Anybody? Nikita Khrushchev. The butcher. He was a bully. 
He was a brute intent on cowering the world into submission. At one point in the United Nations meeting, he took off a shoe and pounded it on the table to intimidate the representatives of the rest of the countries that were there. He brought the U.S. to the very edge of a nuclear holocaust when his actions created the Cuban Missile Crisis. He once declared to the free world, whether you like it or not, history is on our side. We will bury you. You remember that? I remember being a 10 or 12 year old boy when all that was going on. And I remember how the adults in my world were so afraid. We'd go to the grocery store and that's what they would be talking about, was how the world was going to end and, and how some people were digging bomb shelters, remember that? And at school we'd have to have you know, exercises to get under our desks in case there was a nuclear attack. I remember as a boy, I, I remember laying in bed at night and if an airplane flew over, I'd be afraid because I wonder if that was the one that was going to drop a bomb on my house. That was the kind of world we lived in with Nikita Khrushchev, the butcher. To many Americans, Khrushchev was a scary man. He really was. He represented the worst of our enemies. He stood for the struggle between communism and democracy, between totalitarianism and freedom. It was an age of fear and a great concern for many Americans. It was the worst parts of an age that was called the Cold War. Then there was another man. I believe his picture's coming up. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces that ultimately defeated the dark powers of Hitler and Nazi Germany. He was a military genius, and after the war, he became president of Columbia University. He left that in 1951 to become the supreme commander of NATO. In 1952, he was asked to run for president of the United States, which, of course, he won in a sweeping victory. He became the 34th president. And as our president, he dealt with the dangers of this Cold War. And when Stalin died and that power struggle took place, and the butcher of the Ukraine became the leader, things got tense. Eisenhower and Khrushchev stood toe to toe, the leader of the free world facing the leader of the communist powers. Then, one day, Nikita Khrushchev visited Eisenhower in the United States. It was a monumental moment in history. Eisenhower had him on his turf. What strategy could this once great commander of the Allies employ with Khrushchev? Do you know what Eisenhower <coughs> did? He invited him to church. Dwight D. Eisenhower invited Nikita Khrushchev to come to church with him. On Sunday morning, September 27, 1959, was the invitation to invite him to come to a worship service at the Gettysburg Presbyterian Church. Of course, Khrushchev turned him down. But why would Eisenhower invite this anti-God communist to go to church to begin with? Because Eisenhower was a military genius. And he was evidently a man of God. And he knew that no matter how scary this butcher was or no matter how evil communism had been, no matter how godless and profane the Communist Party was, Eisenhower knew that God held the higher ground. And if he could just get Khrushchev to come to church maybe one time, he felt that the power of the gospel of Christ might reach into this cold man's heart and change the course of history. And I believe that's our approach. God holds the higher ground. There's evil all around us. There's scary people everywhere. But God holds the higher ground. And we are soldiers of the cross. And we don't need to be afraid. We can go on the offensive because of Christ. We must know our enemy. We must know his strategies. We must go into the battle prepared until the final victory is won through Jesus. And it's coming. It's coming. We cannot take Satan lightly or underestimate his power in this world. 
and we shouldn't give in to fear and intimidation. But thank God the power of Christ is so much greater than the power of Satan. Aren't you glad about that? So, to finish, don't play around with evil. <coughs> don't play around with it. Don't play footsie with the devil. That's what he wants. And some people will fall into it without even knowing it. And James, one more scripture. James gives us some great teaching on spiritual warfare in James 4. He says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know, I don't use... There, there's, a, there's a version of the Bible called the message, and I hardly ever use it. It's a little too loose for me, but I like the way the message puts that verse I just read in, in language we could very understand. Let's listen to what it says. It says the same verse. It says, so let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious. Really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Let's not play around with Satan. He's too powerful. On our own, he will chew us up. He will spit us out all day long. But with Christ on our side. Our King and our Redeemer and our Savior and our Lord. We have victory. We have victory. We have victory through Christ. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to cower in fear. We have Jesus. And He's won. He's won the victory for us. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. We live in a world, Lord, God, there's evil all around us. Everywhere we go, we turn on our TV, we go to the grocery store, the magazines, there's, there's stuff everywhere. And it's glorified, and it's laughed at, and it's, it's made into a joke. That's just what Satan would want us to do. Help us, Lord. God, help us not to fall into that trap of taking it lightly or ignoring it altogether. But help us to be prepared by reading the scripture, praying, and having your spirit dwell in us. That we know that we have the victory. Lord, for someone today that does not have Christ in their heart and in their lives. Lord, I don't know how they go by every day without you providing the victory for them. I pray today would be the day that they claim that victory and accept you as Savior. Get the Holy Spirit in their lives and no other evil spirit can come and possess us in any way with the Holy Spirit in us. Let this be the day, Lord, that they receive the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll stand and stay. If you have a need today, especially if you don't know Christ as Savior, please come forward. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ. Be baptized. Get the Holy Spirit. And you get a home in heaven forever. It can start today. If you have any other need, please join us. Let's sing.
15 and told Ken that as of today, our note is paid off. Oh man, I don't know what to say except God is good. Amen. All the time. Man, I'll tell you what, that is wonderful news. We're going to have our celebration service, so, you know, and, and to God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. And thank all of you for your generosity and, and let God lead you in the way he did. Praise him. Amen. Hey, Chad, would you close today? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and honor of being in your house today. Or we just ask that you be with us as we leave and we go on <clears throat> through the week forward. We also ask that we can take a message from Tom today, Lord, and we know that all the evil is in this world. That we know who wins and who And Lord, we know we just ask that we ask for your guidance and your leadership.